we did was collect internationally comparable data on as many of those kinds of problems as we could uh, quickly find data for. So from each, for each country, we had life expectancy from WHO, maths and literacy scores for kids from OECD, infant mortality um, also from WHO, homicides, I think from, I'm not sure, I think from WHO, imprisonment, teenage birth rates, measures of trust, I remember that's the World Value Survey, obesity, mental illness, which uh, in these WHO figures include drug and alcohol addiction, and some figures on social mobility. We put them all together in one index. It's a sort of, um, I don't know, you can think of it as a sort of fruit salad of different problems. Um, and uh, they're all weighted equally. So where a country is, is its sort of average position on all those things. Um, and here you see it related to that measure of inequality I've just shown you. Uh, an extraordinarily clear tendency for the more unequal countries, USA, Portugal, UK, to do worse on all those things than Finland, Norway, Sweden, uh, Japan. Again and again, I'm going to be showing you these graphs with the same measure of inequality along the bottom, that one I showed you earlier. And so when you're looking for Belgium, always look above uh, this sort of point. Um, I suppose that's, that spot is Belgium. So it will always be somewhere up there. Um, it's an extraordinarily close relationship. I'm not amazed by, uh, by seeing this, because as you, as you said at the beginning, it's, it's something that we, that we feel, um, especially towards the extremes. And, and I think that's the, the element of caution that I would want to use, is that, of course, you've shown us a, a nice series of, of scatter plots with uh, correlations through it. Uh, of course, correlation is not always the same as causality. Uh, that obviously uh, you know. Uh, there might be other factors that are explaining uh, the correlation that you are uh, showing. Uh, for example, there is a study that says that um, actually attendance to school is the determining factor in academic performance. Um, if that would be the case, then a lot of people would be very successful at school. Um, of course, there is something underlying, that is that attendance and academic performance is actually more determined by motivation, but motivation is not the thing that you're measuring. So, the thing that I would say is, first of all, uh, the extremes are very determined in the correlations that you are forming. I think that on the extremes, I would think that there's not a lot of people who will debate that actually there is, uh, there is an effect. The question is, um, I think that you're actually not going far enough. In the sense that you say, um, in general terms, there is a correlation, a negative correlation between, or a positive correlation between inequality and, and happiness, let's call it happiness in a, in a general sense. The question is, is it, is it really inequality, or is it the lack of uh, social welfare, the lack of good education, the lack of any social system that you actually need in a country to be sure that the majority of your people can get the opportunity that they, that they want. And I um, definitely believe in equality. I believe in uh, equality to the law, of course. I believe in equality of opportunity. But I less believe in um, equality of outcome, in a sense that uh, I want to be sure that everyone gets the same opportunity, everyone gets the same starting base but I do not want to be in a society where the outcome needs to be determined as being equality for everyone. Because I think that stifles creativity, that stifles ambition. I think it's a, it is a very important message, and it's also a very timely message. Um, societies that have an egalitarian ambition and that are effective in delivering equality perform better in many dimensions of human well-being, and I think this is very well shown by, by the facts, and it's an important message. Um, secondly, I think there's a very welcome questioning of the benefits of economic growth for rich societies. That's very welcome, I think, it should make us think. I also think that this book is an important book within the political left, or at least it should uh, spark a, 
a discussion within the left, but not an uncritical one. I, I have two quite important points of disagreement, I think, or maybe questions. We can see whether it's really a disagreement, if I may. Maybe. Um, the first is a, is a kind of a philosophical point, but nevertheless, I want to make it. And I, I do that very succinctly. Um, I would never rest my case for equality on statistical analysis. But to, put, to make it more broadly, I would never rest a fundamentally normative argument, a moral argument, on empirical analysis. I think that uh, Professor Wilkinson is, at least in my reading, I may be wrong here, but he's too dismissive of the, the, the importance of programs and services. Somewhere in the book I think you say, well, specialized services are very expensive and they're not nearly as effective as creating equality. Well, let's take education. Let's take education. If you take Belgium, Germany, Poland, Denmark, and you use the PISA analysis which you use, and I simply take the last PISA reading test, background, background inequality in those countries as measured by the OECD, it's not income inequality, it's poor. The background inequality in those societies, Belgium, Germany, Poland, Denmark, is more or less the same. But in Belgium and Germany, the education system, by its structure, culture, and practices, creates much more inequality than in Poland and Denmark. And so education per se has to be looked at.